Hello everyone. Today we are going to discuss the poem Sunday Morning written by Wallace Stevens. It is prescribed in your paper American Literature. As you listen to the points being discussed here, I want you to pause in between, read the stanzas and then listen to the points being discussed here once again. So that would enable a fuller understanding of the lines and their meanings. Now something about Wallace Stevens. Wallace Stevens was born in Reading, Pennsylvania. He entered the legal profession after attending Harvard and New York University Law School. His writing of poetry developed very slowly and as decidedly secondary to his ordinary successful life in the world of insurance, tables and investments. He published poems in poetry when he was about 35 years of age. His first volume of poems, Harmonium, was published in 1923. The name he gave to his first volume is very significant. As you know, the harmonium is a small reed organ. And this title is a clue to Stephen's lifelong interest in music as a part of his poetic approach. His publication of Ideas of Order, 1935, and The Man with the Blue Guitar, 1937, indicated an increase in Stevens's poetic production and he became one example of a poet very active in his 50s and in his 60s than he had been in his earlier life. His most persistent subject is the opposition between bare reality and what the imagination can make of it, Six, the literary history of United States. So I was just quoting a sentence from the literary history of the United States which describes Stevens thus, I quote, his most persistent subject is the opposition between bare reality and what the imagination can make of it. E even in Sunday morning, the poem that is prescribed uh, for you, we go into this uh, contradiction to this contrast between dream and reality. Now, Sunday morning is an early poem developed luxuriously in his early imaginative style. It brings into confrontation traditional religious meaning and modern doubts of such religious conventions suffused with a preoccupation with sensory enjoyment. So that's just an introduction to Wallace Stevens and something about the poem Sunday Morning which is a very early poem written by Stevens luxuriously developed in his early imaginative style. And as I said it brings to light the confrontation between traditional religious meaning and modern doubts of such religious conventions. Now let's move into the poem proper. So before we start a discussion of the poem proper, let's have a discussion on the title of the poem Sunday Morning. Sunday Morning is a title which apparently has little to do with what happens in the poem. Being Sunday, it is a day of church going and therefore of meditation and prayer for the devout Christian. For the poet, the title supplies a necessary occasion for a speculation upon the verity and value of Christian belief. So the poet takes this as an opportunity to think about the truthfulness of Christian beliefs. Wallace Stevens writes like an agnostic who takes a stand between the fundamental faith of Christianity and the exuberance of paganism. It almost resembles the thought contained in Wordsworth's sonnet, The World is Too Much With Us, where the poet contemplates the possibility of leaving Christianity and embracing the outworn creed of paganism. Here, Wallace Stevens embraces paganism by producing Jesus Christ as essentially a human figure without any supernatural sanction behind crucifixion and resurrection. Ironically, these are just the thoughts that are not fit for a Christian mind on a Sunday morning. So when we hear the title Sunday morning, we obviously expect it to be something uh, based on an event that happened either on a Sunday morning, it ought to be some religious events, some religious stories taken from the Bible, maybe connected to the lives of saints or things like that. But unfortunately, no. The poet writes about thoughts which are never to be mused on a Sunday morning. The poem thus gains the quality of modernity with its paradox, tension and irony. So this poem 
becomes modern in the sense it's marked by paradox, tension and irony. The structural pattern of the poem is presented in the very first stanza, that is the opening stanza. It begins in reality, which is balanced by the reality transformed as a dream. The diction is deliberately made to be so, uh, to sound solemn, elevated and high strung in order to harmonize with the seriousness of the subject matter. The chief figure is an aristocratic lady seated in a sunny chair. She wears a comfort-giving pain war that is a nightgown. The choice of the French word is deliberate. We know that the French language supplied us words uh, that indicate luxury or a lavish lifestyle. And this is the word used by Stevens here. The chief figure, the lady, she wears a comfort-giving pain war that is a luxurious nightgown. She is surrounded by things of a luxurious and leisurely life coffee, oranges, green rug with the image of a flying cockatoo on it. These materials or these material things mingle and thus dissipate her holy thoughts about the ancient sacrifice. So surrounded by a world of real objects which include oranges, a comfort giving pain war, a cup of steaming, a steaming cup of coffee, all these things mingle to dissipate her thoughts about the ancient sacrifice of Christ. This happens on a Sunday morning. Now the lady has a dream. To her, the memory of the catastrophe of crucifixion is like a dark shadow falling across water lights. Everything around her becomes part of a dreamy procession. Coffee, oranges, a rug and her own feet are silently marching over soundless seas towards Jerusalem, the dominion of blood and sepulchre. Just look at the strangeness of diction, the balance between reality and dream, the mingling of different images and the evocation of Christ as a figure of fantasy haunting the modern mind. So here, Stevens has conveyed the central tension of the poem between the indifferent woman and that towards which she is indifferent, namely religion. She is surrounded by coffee, oranges, a comfort giving uh, nightgown, a rug containing the beautiful picture of a coquetto. But still the woman is unable to dismiss considerations of immortality for, from her mind. And that is why she is dreaming about the ancient sacrifice, namely the crucifixion of Christ, which is referred to as the old catastrophe. So the lady starts dreaming. She dreams a little and she feels a dark encroachment of that old catastrophe as a calm darkness among the water lights. Even in the midst of comfort giving objects which are real, she goes into a dream thinking about the old catastrophe. The real objects are transformed. They become the pungent oranges and bright green wings, they all seem to be things in some procession, winding across wide water without sound. So all objects around her, including her own feet, seem to become a part of a procession. And all these objects seem to be crossing wide water without sound. Maybe Stevens has brought in the reference to water or a river or sea to recall the boundary between the living and the dead as mentioned in Greek mythology, the river Styx. For one reason, the women's inability to escape religion is that the day is like wide water without sound. Even in large cities, Sunday is the stillest day of the week. The silence inevitably forces the woman to consider immortality. Stilled for the passing of her dreaming feet over the seas to silent Palestine, dominion of blood and sepulchre. So she had been enjoying the real objects around her. Suddenly she falls into a dream about the ancient catastrophe and all the real objects, her own feet, are now crossing the silent seas 
to Palestine, which is the domain and the place of Jesus Christ, the place associated with Jesus Christ. The musing woman prepares herself for a mental walk on water towards Palestine. So there is, there might be a reference to Jesus walking over water. So just look at that. The lady who is sitting enjoying the reality of objects on a Sunday morning slowly skips or falls into a dream. And now she is preparing herself for a mental walk on water. And she is going to the place that is associated with Christianity, namely Palestine. So the tension is between the woman who wants to enjoy Sunday and at the same time unable to resist the force of tradition. So she wants to enjoy the earthly life or the luxuries provided by earthly life, especially on a Sunday morning. But at the same time, she falls into the dreams of an old catastrophe because she is unable to resist the force of tradition. In the second stanza, the poet raises skeptical questions. Why should she give away the gifts of her earthly life to the dead memory of her God? What is divinity if it cannot appear as reality instead of always remaining behind mystical veils of fantasies and dreams? The lady should find heaven on earth. The coffee, the fruit, the birds and the beauty of the earth are enough heaven. The poet here gives a catalogue of heavenly bliss found in nature. We have rain, falling snow, the blooming forest, wind over red wet roads, summer trees and winter branches. These are capable of filling her soul with emotions, pleasures and pains so that she need not be bothered about a divinity that never comes into reality. So her question is, why should she give away the gifts of her earthly life to the dead memory of her God. As I said, not the thoughts meant to be mused by a Christian on a Sunday morning. In the third stanza, the divinity of paganism and Christianity is a subject matter. He brings in the case of Job. Job was not born of a mother. He was a mythical fantasy associated with thunder. Then came the birth of Christ. The Son of God was born of a human mother. It was a virginal birth. Is it possible to mingle human blood with the blood of paradise? Or is paradise only our illusion and the earth the only paradise that we make? The poet's answer is that the sky will be more friendly to man if we do not suppose that the sky separates man from God. Therefore, it is better to believe in an earthly paradise than to fantasize a heaven. So you find that the poet now takes direct aim at religion with the intention of dismissing it altogether as a viable force. He's trying to recall ancient religion by bringing in Job as a case in point. The distance between Job and his people was wa vast, very vast. It was just like the distance between a king and his very inferior subjects. So he is describing the distance between Job and his people as being very vast. There was simply no connecting link between Job and mankind. And then Stevens tries to make a direct attempt to bridge the gap. Christ was incarnate, the product of virgin human blood and divine blood mingling together. But the distance between man and God still remains for man. He declares that where this earth the only paradise in existence, man no longer disturbed by the problem of reconciling humanity and divinity would be much happier. So if there is no distance between man and God, then the sky would appear much friendlier, Stephen says. So if earth is the only paradise, then nature would be much familiar, the sky would be much familiar. We think of the sky as separating man from heaven or earth from heaven. And that brings in the complexity, the mystery. So according to Stevens, it is better to believe in an earthly paradise than to fantasize a heaven. 
The lady, however, is not convinced. So we move on to stanza four, where we find that the lady is not convinced. She is perfectly happy when birds swing up and sing in misty mornings, but they come and go. They are impermanent. Paradise is permanent, so we believe we believe it is eternal. To the lady's skepticism, the poet's answer is that notions of paradise, happy islands, magical sounds are only man-made fantasies. Their apparent permanence is illusory. Contrasted to this, we have the certainty of April green. When April is gone, we remember it. Before summer comes, we sing of its sweetness. So earthly things sustain their permanence through memory and desire. Paradisal fantasies have no substance, and therefore they never become real. So what we find is that the woman declares her satisfaction with the earth as all of paradise that we shall know. Stevens portrays a sensory experience of observing the flight of birds or evening as man's ultimate enjoyment or the height of desire being fulfilled. But still the lady says, I quote, but in contentment, I still feel the need of some imperishable bliss. So there is a contrast between earth and paradisal fantasies. But nevertheless, she says that she is in need of some imperishable bliss. So as we move on to stanza 5, we understand that it is the climax of the poem where the poet introduces his central philosophy. Death is the mother of beauty. The lady's demand is that she wants imperishable bliss. To this, the poet's answer is that our consciousness of bliss is the product of our knowledge that it will be lost. Death, therefore, is the mother of all our happiness. Beauty is the source of happiness, or as Keats puts it, a thing of beauty is a joy forever. But we become aware of beauty only when we know that beauty would soon perish. Life is made up of memories and desires, joys and sorrows. Our consciousness of life is given to us by the fact of death. That is why we often say that good things are always felt in their absence. We enjoy the beauty of something only when we know that it will soon perish or it will soon be destroyed. Nature everywhere shows herself through symbols of death. The leaves that are strewn on our path speak of the certainty of death. When we fall ill or when we triumph over victory in war or when we murmur words of love or when we gather gifts waiting for the lady or when the lady tastes the fruit and walk over the littering leaves, death, death remains as a permanent reality. If the lady wants imperishable bliss, she should know that bliss itself is the gift of God. Death is the assurance of life and there is nothing beyond death. Our memory and desire through which we preserve our bliss are valid only because of death. As Ivo Winder points out, I quote, It is our awareness of the imminence of death which heightens our emotions and sharpens our perception of life's beauty. When we understand that death is at hand, we try to enjoy life. We try to find out or seek the real beauty of life. Now as we move on to the sixth stanza, we understand there that the idea of paradise as a place without change is nullified. There cannot be a reality without change. But the fruit must ripen and fall. The river must flow to seek the sea. The waves must touch the shore. These things happen on earth. How can these be different in paradise? If there is a paradise, there should be rivers, fruit-bearing trees, colors, smells, afternoons, music, and all these things must be subject to change exactly as they are on heaven. Death is like the earthly mother, eternally waiting for the return of her son. Probably, here Stevens must have had at the back of his mind the concluding lines of paradise regained where Jesus returns home to his mother after 40 days of fasting, overcoming all temptations. So what Stevens is actually trying to suggest is that it is because of death that we understand the beauty of life, the beauty of all things around us. So Stevens is actually emotionally aroused, but at the same time, he is unable to hide his personal dissatisfaction with the finality of death. 
So it remains a problem that relentlessly harasses man. So death is the mother of beauty. And at this point, the poet has rejected all religious conceptions of paradise. But the necessity of somehow reconciling humanity to divinity still remains. So how can this be bridged? How can humanity and divinity be brought together? Reality and uh, dream be combined? The reality of earth and the fantasies about paradise be brought together? Having thus argued against the religious paradise, the poet returns to an orgy of sun worship. Stevens presents a hypothetical possibility for religion, a vision of future race of men engaged in a religious ritual. Men are to devote themselves to the sun, the symbol of transient earthly beauty. So that, uh, that is what is meant by the orgy of sun worship. The sun is not worshipped as a god as primitive men did, but as a source of life inducing light. As the men dance and sing, the sky, the windy lake, the trees, the hills, the summer morn, and all those who are dead will become one. There is no mystery anywhere. There is only joy, sheer joy that is as clear as sunlight. When we are lost in such happiness, we realize that life is nothing more mysterious than the dew that melts under our feet. So by reducing the supernatural to the natural, man is to effect the union of himself with the divine and thereby resolve the tension that exists between the two, two namely human, humanity and divinity. The concluding stanza sums up the argument in the poem. The poem ends where it begins. The lady realizes the tomb of Jerusalem is the grave of Jesus. Jesus is man and not God. His earth is a broken fragment of chaos of the sun. It is no longer seen as a creation of God, but as the nature out of which we evolve. Now as the earth moves round its poles, we have days and nights. As it moves round the sun, we have seasons and nature with its waters, quails and mountains, singing birds, ripened fruits, distant sky and morning and evening. When birds fly up and down and they disappear in the darkness, there is the full and final acceptance of the reality of earthly life as against the fantasies of religion. Stevens substitutes the word chaos for divine providence and dependency of day and night for man's reliance on God and man's solitude on earth for the relationship of natural man with supernatural God. It looks like the problem of bridging the gap between humanity and divinity will always be there with man. In Sunday morning, Stevens rejects a host of religious attempts to envision a paradise that is viable and meaningful for man. He argues both sides of the question of the afterlife and leaves the problem unresolved. He simply resigns himself to the undeniable fact of man's continuing need for some imperishable bliss. So read the whole poem again, listen to the points once more and I hope it will help you to have a richer and fuller understanding of the poem titled Sunday Morning. Thank you. Take care. Stay safe and stay healthy.